I'm Rob Spall. And I'm Britt Garner. Welcome to Nature Insight. Speed dating with the future. Speed dating is about having a short time to communicate things that could change your life. And that's exactly what we're going to do on this podcast. This is a podcast where we introduce you to some extraordinary people who are thinking deeply about our current and future relationship with the natural world. Experts and stakeholders who've been part of a developing dialogue around the newest ideas and the latest developments in the field of biodiversity. And everybody who you're going to be hearing on the podcast is a member of the IPBIS wider community. And IPBIS stands for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. You want to give us a quick definition of biodiversity there, Rob? You're putting me on the spot, Britt, but (laughs) I think the easiest way to describe biodiversity is that we're talking about the variety of all life on Earth and that it falls into three main categories. There's biodiversity of ecosystems, which we also call habitats. There's biodiversity of species, so plants and animals. And there's genetic biodiversity. In its most simple form, it's nature. I always find it fascinating that, uh, you know, we include habitats because when we say biodiversity, we're thinking bio as in living. But, you know, habitats also include non-living. So biotic and abiotic factors that these things are all together. You can't piece one away from the other. We've got some people represented on this podcast who I think would take issue with you on the question about whether or not abiotic actually represents living or not living. I think there are some communities who may very well consider all parts of an ecosystem to well be part of life and part of what is in fact alive. I love that you mentioned that because my definition is very much so an academic one. And it just so happens that as those values change and if the value system moves away from here's how we're defining it in a textbook to here's how we define it within our culture and community, these can be absolutely different things. And I know when the IPBIS Global Assessment came out in 2019 and I read it, one of the most interesting things that jumped out was the incorporation of traditional knowledge and of knowledge systems expanding past this potentially more academic and more Western value of thinking. I think the global assessment and the work that IPBIS does is so rich precisely because it offers a framework and a context that can really resonate with different types of communities, different types of people, different cultures, because it takes its first step from the belief that there is value in almost every type of knowledge system. And that taking that value, taking the evidence and taking the expertise and and the knowledge from different systems and different worldviews has real value in informing better decisions. From a data science perspective, too, you know, it's it's so much better to widen that net as far as the probability spaces for answering the questions that we have, which just absolutely makes total sense. And I know that I was not the only one who was really moved by these pieces of the global assessment. You know, in fact, Rob, as you know, our podcast for this week is with Billy Offlin. He was also completely rocked by the global assessment that came out in 2019. And he's only 22 years old, but he took a, a very bold step after reading the assessment. He was at college in Britain studying sustainability. And like me, he was really engaged with and affected by what he read. And so his choice was to go see more for himself. He wanted to see it firsthand. And he brilliantly convinced his college that he should, you know, take a pause and go off on a two-year trip to meet people working in conservation, which wonderfully they allowed. And I believe he's also linked up with IPBIS. Is that correct? Yes, and Billy came to our attention through social media. He first posted about his decision on his Instagram account, and he tagged IPBIS when he was doing that because of the impact that the Global Assessment Report had in inspiring his journey. So we reached out to him, and we found out a bit more about what he was planning, and we realized how powerful that very personal story of impact was could be. So we began to feature some of the elements of his journey uh, on our website and also through some YouTube videos that he had put together. And our relationship has grown from there. And it's so fascinating because the entire way that you and I met was because I tagged it this on Twitter from the video I'd made about the global assessment. So what I'm trying to say is you guys are really hip and very on top of things. <laughs> But the one thing I think that really struck me with Billy when we first started talking was his 
very deep realization of the level of privilege that he was able to enjoy to have the opportunity to experience a journey of this nature, because it's clearly not the kind of opportunity that most people anywhere in the world would ever get the chance to do. So his commitment to doing it in a way that would share his experiences, that would allow him to show people these different knowledge systems and these different approaches to conservation and to nature. I think that was what really resonates with so many of the members of our community. Oh, absolutely. And communication, I know, is something that you, something that me, something that Billy all are passionate about. And he unfortunately had to take a pause in his trip due to COVID-19. So he was back home, but we still got to catch up and speak about his journey. And the first thing I asked him was about his general plans for this two-year trip and also how far he'd gotten before having to come home. Before I got cut short, I was eight months in and I traveled, basically done a U-shape across Europe, Northern Asia, around the Pacific Islands and back through Asia and was just about to go through the Middle East. So I guess when it's safe enough to go back, I'll try and complete that, go back to where I left off, the Middle East, potentially through Africa, through South America. We do know that traveling can be one of the you know, biggest inputs of carbon pollution and other things. Can you tell us a little bit about that balance between traveling to learn about conservation and also making sure that you are not creating a huge impact? That was one of the things I struggled with massively before embarking on this journey. But so what I did, I mean, I don't like flying much anyway. And trying to travel as much by land as possible Although it may be more difficult, more time consuming and potentially more expensive, it was more of an adventure, allowing me to see more of a country, engaging with the people and the population to really understand what's going on. Sure. And so much of that, I think, in terms of understanding place has to do with understanding the species there, including the human species there and the kind of way that humans interact with the land they live in and with the other species that share that habitat. Yeah, it's all down to that human interaction with our environment and the things that live alongside us. The place I jumped into, first of all, Montenegro was a perfect example for this and how it sort of shook my foundations a little bit early. I went there to visit a man called Ilya Setkovich, who works at the Institute of Marine Biology over in Kotor. He was showing me their new plans for a marine protected area in the bay. They were the last country in Europe to not have a marine protected area. And then to hear from him that they don't know when it's going to go ahead. It could take a year, two years to be pushed through. After seeing what I thought was the urgency from the global assessment, to see things like this put on the back burner because potential conflicts with tourism or development was really tough. And this sort of contrasted massively to places further down the line in the Pacific Islands, for example. And I think a great example is Palau, a beautiful island nation which is revered for its unbelievably pristine marine life and coral reefs, attracts scuba divers from all around the world. And as such a big tourist destination, what I saw there was that these guys actually scaled back their developments when they started to realize the effects it was having on their biodiversity and on their marine life, which they depend on. And I think this all referred back to an amazing conversation I had with a wonderful man called Bob Pressey, who runs the conservation planning department at the University of James Cook in Australia. He was saying it's all really how much we're willing to give up. And that was sort of contrasted with another thing that I'd heard from Karen Stone, a conservationist in Tonga. And she was saying that we're doing conservation so there can be more, so people can have more. And that's what's so complicated and beautiful and nuanced is that those choices to give things up are self-serving, but they at the same time serve so many other purposes. Yeah, and this is all down to people's relationships with nature, I feel. But I guess one of the most exciting experiences I had was over in Australia when I was invited by ITBIS member of the multidisciplinary expert panel, Judith Fisher, an amazing woman. And she sent me a rather cryptic message, which is like, Billy, I want you to come over to Western Australia for something very special with traditional owners. And this ended up with me heading over there to go and visit a meeting from the Matawara Fitzroy River Council. 
And these guys were basically looking to protect the mighty Fitzroy River, which runs through the Kimberley. And this river is one of the largest unregulated rivers in Australia, which when floods turns into one of the biggest in the world. It's unbelievable. It's like the center of their cultural life for the Aboriginals that live there, as well as the biodiversity of the region. And I think you'll like this, Brit. As a shark lover yourself, they've got some of the homes of very threatened elasma branks, like the freshwater sawfish and load of other bits about that. Oh, now you're talking my language. Freshwater <laughs> elasma branks. Oof, bring it on. <laughs> but unfortunately, speaking to Aboriginals there at the council, the indigenous people, they were saying that the river hasn't been flowing properly recently. And it's actually at the lowest level that it's been in 10 years. And they say this is due to sort of unsustainable water extraction to feed pastoral activities and things like that. What was amazing was that this council had come together, made up of seven native title groups who came together for the first time in 40 years to write a management plan based on their unique principles of conservation and sustainability and to vet any development projects that they don't like. And for me, that was it made sense. It's like these guys have managed sustainably this area for the past 40,000 years. This knowledge is invaluable. These different knowledge systems and understandings of the environment for people who really managed it since the beginning of time really needs to be understood and incorporated alongside Western science. And some of that has to do with communication and storytelling, I know. And for your purposes, you collected audio and video and interviews as you kind of went along the way. Yes. So, I mean, I actually interviewed some of the people at the meeting, as well as one that I want to share here with you from Dr. Anne Polina, who's the chair of the Matawara Fitzroy River Council and a real leader in the community to protect the Fitzroy and the indigenous culture and values around this. But what she also is, is a prominent global researcher, really trying to bring this story and traditional knowledge global. And I first met her and we went down to be introduced and give respect to the Fitzroy itself in the traditional way. Me rubbing mud on my armpits and to throw it into the river while shouting my name. And the conversation we had down here was amazing. But there was one bit that really stuck out for me. And this is one I'd like to share with you now. This is a story in terms of looking at rivers globally, that they are the lifeblood of our nation. We call it wake up the snake. Mm -hmm. Wake up the snake means how do you wake up the consciousness of the people so that you've got this coalition of hope, The revolution is with the people, not with governments. And through your sorts of storytelling, that's what can bring people on the journey mm -hmm. of why they should care. Waking up the snake, waking up the collective consciousness. That's just so incredible as far as it relates to both you and I. I feel like this this assessment did that for us in part. Yeah, I agree. And just being by the river itself and calls it like a magical place. And really just sitting there listening to it, there's a real feeling you get. And there's actually a song, that I, a piece of music that I was sent by Anne, which was by her son who goes over the name by the moniker Kalaji called River Feeling, which I'd also like to play to sort of bring that sense of feeling and place here as well. Absolutely lovely. Billy, the thing I love the most, I think, is the combination of human and non-human sounds. There is such a wide variety of, of voices. Um, I heard birds, I heard the river, I heard the instrumentation, I'm sure all kinds of other things making sounds maybe we can't even hear, but almost a symphony of human and non-human sounds. Yeah, I mean, just being there was with Anne was unbelievable. I don't want to just tell you about what I've learned, so I've arrange for us to actually connect to Anne now, who's in Australia and who's happy to chat with us about the river and the incorporation of this traditional knowledge into global frameworks. That sounds awesome. Let's do it. Before we start, I, I'd just like to acknowledge country. Jada Buru Yaru, Mabunguru Nyan Nganga Nyundo Billy, Ngayo, 
and Polina Nayo Imadora Man and Gamada Jara Nigan and Nigan and Anga. So I just said, uh, just acknowledging that this is Yaru country in Broome, which is my home. It's a very, very special place. And I was just also acknowledging with the call out that we are honoring the Marawar, the Fitzroy River, and just paying our respect to Billy as the young leader is taking us on this journey. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share and speak with you all. No, thank you so much for this, Anne. It's so great to be able to connect like this. Hi, Anne. It is so awesome to have you here. Thank you so, so much for making time and for talking to us. But you're also on lockdown, aren't you, Anne? How's it going for you over there? (laughs) I think I'm more busy. What COVID has done is taken people back to country and isolated them, but made them aware of how precious the river is to our daily survival and to our life ways and to our livelihoods. We have an amazing sacred river, which is 733 kilometres long, filled with amazing Indigenous people. And it was interesting because I was thinking, how do you get people to value what they're so closely entwined with? And then COVID came along and for a lot of the communities, it's almost impossible to get fresh food in you know, paying prices like $9 for a lettuce and you kind of go, well, we better go back to what actually brought us to this space and what's cared for us and our reciprocal relationship as Indigenous farmers for caring for this land. So what it's done is it's opened up people's eyes to actually what is climate change or climate chaos, as I call it, what is it doing on country that's changing our life ways, looking at the changes in terms of what the old people have taught me is to look for the signs up in the sky, down in the ground. And what we're seeing already is water scarcity, uh, food insecurity. In a way, it's been a bit of a, um, a soft way to take people back to country and revalue what we have in our world and why it is so precious, why we need to stand collectively together and be united. And is this unity that you're experiencing right now, is this something new or is this something that's just always been there? As we get together, we realise that there's more about sameness than difference. But because of the journey of colonialism, what it's done is it's forced people into a competitive space where it's been conflictual. So the relationships that I've grown up with and where my great-grandmothers come from come from a relationship of conflict. We're finding that we still share the same song line or the river law, Wallangari law. We are all connected under that first law law of the land, law of the river, not law of man. We are all still today in contemporary 2020, still practicing Walangari law. We are still united by that law and we still practice that law in unity with all of the nations along the river. One of the things this story is doing is a healing and a restoration of well-being and our life ways to stand together in unity about how we manage the developments that are being proposed for the Fitzroy River. And speaking of these developments, could you tell us more about the actual aim or goals of the Fitzroy River Council and kind of specifically what you've been working on? This has been a journey of reconciliation, of healing, of intellectualizing at multiple levels what we need to do in terms of preserving this amazing ancient wisdom that we hold as guardians of the Fitzroy River, the Marawara, how do we take some of our thinking into modernity? And then how do we make that filter out across the planet? So for us, it's about not only how do we build strong leadership, how do we build strong governance? How do we look at what can the new economies be in terms of our own and beyond that livelihood? But What we're also saying is that we will start with ourselves, but we are sending the dream out that our nation state, Australia, will also examine their own practice and their own governance. The river itself, and I remember being there with you, and it's that feeling you get, it's such a special place and such a mighty entity of a river. But there are constant attempts really from corporations and governments to develop and change it, aren't there? How do you respond to these attempts? What we're saying to multinational corporations is that we can create profit, we can work together, we can create what we call on country the forever industries in terms of renewable, in terms of culture, in terms of conservation, in terms of science. These answers are all be in front of us. And what we're saying as Indigenous people is that we've got amazing opportunity 
to really create serious wealth creation, but it can't happen without the engagement of Indigenous people in so many different ways. And could you imagine a branding where you've got, you know, that sort of Indigenous um, partnerships in terms of actually looking at the resources that come from the land in a balanced way with corporates to be able to serve uh, humanity better rather than dig it up, ship it out, let's continue to pollute because that's all we know. Yeah, and one of the things that really struck me with you and the council was how people talk about the river as a living being. And I love that. It is deserving of respect. Could you explain that just a little bit more to us? Like, what did you mean by that? So through First Law, through Walangari Law, through the creation of the river, we know that this serpent, this ancestral being is still alive today. We can take researchers out to country and they can say to us, I heard the river waking up. It is a living being. It flows. It communicates with us. We communicate with it. What I'm not arguing is the river's right to life. I'm arguing the river's right to live. And so it sounds like there is the idea of and the feel and the truth of the river being its own intrinsic being. But I know I've also heard discussion of protecting it or there being oversight of this land and river by Indigenous people. How are those two connected? From a first law perspective, we don't own the river. The river owns us. I am a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River. So There's a whole different set of values, of ethics, that is combined with accepting and acknowledging that we have this continuing relationship with the Fitzroy River. When we are born, we are given what I call in my language, a jaring. Jaring means a totem. It's an animal. It's a creature. And we are then aligned with that creature for life. My totem is blue tongue lizard. Having a jaring teaches us very, very early to build this ethics of care as it creates empathy in allowing us to equate equity values with a non-human being so that we care beyond the me to the we. So we're trying to introduce these new concepts that, yes, country is alive, country can talk, and we as the guardians are voiceful for the river or for country but it has a rightful place in this world. This really resonates with me. I'm remembering reading Aldo Leopold's Land Ethic when I was younger. And, you know, that's when I first learned about this idea of extending a personal ethic between, say, you and I, or between, say, myself and a non-human companion like my cat Jane, you know, extending past that and saying that the land itself is a piece of this ethics system. You know, this this writing had a really big impact on me about how I think and feel about where I live and, you know, who I am. So how do we bring this idea to more people? How do we communicate this to the world? For us as Indigenous people, and this is a, a sameness all around the world from Indigenous people, our engagement, our research paradigm is all about story. And how do you tell that story, I guess, is the big challenge. And so what I'm saying is that there's multiple audiences out there. And so we need multiple ways to be able to share that story. It can be a poem. It can be a song. It can be a story. It can be an animation. And this is some of the things that we're working with our young leaders. How do we take the modern technology that young people are connected to and bring in the ancient wisdom so that we can create the stories that we have in first law to be able to share them in classrooms in teaching and learning, to be able to share them through universities in terms of creating curriculum and education pedagogy that values Indigenous wisdom. I'm in the middle of just finishing my second PhD and there is just overwhelming evidence about what we should be doing right. How to right size the planet from multiple sources, from IPBES, from IUCN, from everybody globally. And so what we need is a different way to communicate, to catch the heart and the emotions of people to bring them on the storytelling journey. So, you know, different audiences will need different things, but um, it's all about story. Yeah, the Indigenous storytelling, Anne, is a very, very powerful and proven way to make sure that we can have this land ethic and respect for the natural world around us. And technology really is a powerful tool in order to expose people to these new ideas and wake up the snake is one of the amazing things you've told me before. But if you could communicate one message to the rest of the world now, what do you think it would be? 
I think if I was to leave a message in terms of where we need to go from COVID, um, there's a very, very long story, but at the end of that story, it takes me to an experience that I had in Chicago almost 30 years ago now. I had a quite a horrific experience. Um, <clears throat> and so I got, I got in a car with my husband and I said, we need to go somewhere and we need to find a certain person, which was a, a First Nations healer. We had a ceremony and um, we told him what was happening to us and he, he sort of stood really quiet. And my husband and I were in the room and we weren't sure what was going on. And he just stood there very quietly. And he looked at me and he said several times, he said, do you realize, do you realize that you have the power? And I was a little bit confused and I was looking at my husband and he looked at me and he said it again. He said, you have the power because we are human beings. And in order to be a good human being, you need to be brave. So my message that I would be sending to the world is that it's time for the humans to right-size the planet and look at how do we mobilise at a broader level because in eight and us, we are an amazing creature because we are human beings. But in order to reach our full potential and to bring others with us, we have to realise that what we're going into requires a level of being brave. Kalia Marble. Billy, thank you so much for um, being another brave human being and introducing us to Anne and uh, bringing some of that story to life. And hopefully you and I can continue that storytelling to these different audiences. And hey, as you travel the world, you might want to check in with me in Montana. There's all kinds of stories uh, out here for you, I'm sure. Thank you for having me on, Brit. It's really been a pleasure. I'm so glad we could get Anne on here to share her wisdom as well. Potentially I'll be over there as soon as it gets safe, so I'll have to give you a shout. That sounds great. Cheers, Billy. That was an incredible interview, Britt. I'm actually extremely jealous that you got to have such an incredible conversation with both Billy and Anne. You know, when, when we started the Nature Insight podcast, it was always with the aim of really giving amplification to different voices from within our IPAS community about the values of nature. And what a great way to do that with Billy and with Anne. And, and you know, even the incredible sounds of the river, which really brings that home. We, we talked about at the beginning of this episode, the definition of what is and what isn't alive. I think that interview really sets that question in, in a very different light. Absolutely. I'm so thankful for that conversation. And also, as we discussed at the top of the program, you know, the idea of communication, the idea of storytelling and how, how important words are and someone to hear them, being able to say something, but also for that thing to be taken in as well. The level of vision and the level of imagery that springs to mind when you hear concepts like wake the snake. And, and one of the things that really struck me was this concept of agency and the agency that Anne is talking about for each one of us, that we all have the ability to really make a change, to wake the snake in our own lives, to make a difference, this transformational change, the transformative change that we've been talking about. Right. And that just all plays into the validity of different knowledge systems within a global framework, thinking about the future in all of the different ways that we possibly can. You know, one of the things that really struck me when I first joined IPBIS, we were busy with the aftermath of our first report that we'd launched, which was about pollination and pollination's link to food security and to food production. And it was also my first introduction to IPBIS's approach to indigenous and local knowledge. One of the stories that always sticks with me is this concept that a sixth or seventh generation beekeeper in central Mexico is going to have more understanding and more insight into the value of pollination and the links between pollination and food production than almost any tenured professor is likely to have. And this is the thing, we, for too long, our communities and our approach to evidence and knowledge has been somewhat constrained. I love the way which within the IPBIS community, we're really able to tap into some of these additional ways of looking at the world and, and approaching knowledge. 
Well, and even with science, the idea that science is exploration, not explanation, at least to me personally. And I think the way that knowledge can be gained by observation instead of direct experimentation, by simply existing, by listening to stories, by having that knowledge pass generation to generation, these are all ways that the scientific process explores the world around us. And something else for us to, I think, bear in mind as well is that indigenous peoples manage, use, or occupy, or are stewards over more than 25% of all land on the planet. And it's in these areas that average biodiversity loss is considerably less than elsewhere. Clearly, we have much to learn from indigenous communities and local communities. And certainly it will be our challenge to think about how to scale those practices to other places for that knowledge to then be used and applied in different systems. That's it for today's Nature Insights, Speed Dating with the Future. I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. As we heard today, IPAS's global assessment really did wake many of us in the world to the need for transformative change. So in next week's episode, we're going to be thinking about what transformative change really means and how can we make it happen. I'll be talking to Professor Kai Chan, who was one of the experts who wrote the IPBIS Global Assessment, specifically the part of the Global Assessment dealing with different pathways to a sustainable future. Be sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. And if you want to learn more about conservation and IPBIS's work, go to www.ipbis.net or any of the IPBIS social media channels. Just search for at IPBIS, that's at I-P-B-E-S. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Thank you.